screen okay? And we're really gonna talk about two things. First, what is the right time? What is the right light uh, to get the most dramatic landscaped images? And then secondly, how do you plan for success? How do you plan ahead for finding the right light? And before I start, let's talk about what I call the, my five C's of photography. Um, the first of those is composition. And we, if you heard my talk about uh, perspective, that really talks about composition. Uh, what do you include in the image? Where do you put the camera? How do you frame it? Things like that. Obviously very important. Um, next is the capture itself. By capture, I'm talking about the shutter speed, the f-stop, the ISO, focus, depth of field, all those kind of uh, science-y kinds of things. The third C is the camera. And that's actually the least important of all of the five Cs. Uh, it does make some difference that it, you need an appropriate camera, but better camera or worse camera won't necessarily make uh, the, a big difference between a better or worse picture. Just don't tell my wife I said that. Next is the computer. And here I'm talking about post-processing. Uh, some people do a lot, some people don't do any, uh, but it can make a huge difference, certainly much more difference than the camera or and frequently more difference than the actual capture. Uh, so an area that I encourage anybody to learn more about. But the fifth is really the most important and that's the concept. And no less than Ansel Adams said, there's nothing worse than a fuzzy photo or a sharp photo of a fuzzy concept. And what we're really talking tonight about tonight is the concept of dramatic landscapes and finding the right light in order to create a dramatic landscape image. And the good news is that landscape photography is really very basic. Uh, you don't need a fancy expensive camera. Uh, all you need is a basic camera and generally you want a tripod. Uh, but beyond that, you don't need a lot of special photographic knowledge. Uh, you don't need special camera settings or any you know, secret handshakes. Uh, you don't really need any particular special skills uh, such as trying to focus on a flying bird. And you don't need a lot of specialized equipment like gimbals or lights or triggers and some of those kinds of things. Uh, what you really just need to do is be at the right place at the right time. And that by far is the most important factor is being there at the right time. When it comes to landscape photos, I kind of drop them into three different categories. And this is roughly based on a series of essays by the late Michael Reichman, who was the founder of the Luminous Landscape. Um, and those three categories are snapshot, postcard, and fine art. And I don't mean to imply that one is better or more important than the other. They just serve different purposes. Uh, a snapshot is generally a memorable scene and the photo is about your memory. It's something that's important to you. Uh, it's something that you're glad you have. It may not be great art. It may not be meaningful to other people, but it's very meaningful to you. And so what makes it a snapshot is that it's about your memory. A postcard is usually a, a beautiful scene or a scene in very attractive light, but usually, usually not both but it's a classic view uh, probably that a lot of people have seen. And the photo is about the location. So it's a memory that's important to you, but it also would trigger memories in other people and be important and meaningful to people other than just yourself. In the fine art category, it's maybe a beautiful scene with and with dramatic light and or a really special moment. Uh, the, it's frequently a scene that is not noticed by people. Uh, maybe they walk right by it. Maybe it's a macro that people wouldn't have seen or a special location that most people can't get to. Um, but the photo is about more than just the scene itself. And you know that kind of brings me to point out there's a difference between a beautiful photo of a scene and a photo of a beautiful scene. Snapshots tend to be a photo of a beautiful scene where the postcard or fine art would be more of a beautiful photo of a scene. And frequently what you'll find is light is the biggest difference. You know, the quality of light, the direction of light, the color of light, and all those are really dictated by the time of day. 
And, and I don't want to imply that there aren't other important factors like creativity, technique, composition, post-processing, but most of the time what you find is light is one of the biggest differentiating factors uh, in the different kinds of images. So I've got some examples. Here's a photo of a, of a small river in Indiana where uh, we took the family on vacation and we floated down this river. So as a snapshot, this photo has a lot of important memories to me. I remember floating down it with the, the kids and the grandkids. I remember camping. I remember hiking along this trail and coming to this overlook and think, gosh, you know, there's a good view of the river that we just floated down. And also I was doing some scouting. I thought, well, that'd be nice to go back at sunset because it is a nice overlook and pretty decent view. So I went back at sunset and as the sun was going down, we got more interesting light on the scene, more interesting clouds in the sky. Still probably kind of a snapshot. And in fact, there were some other people standing at the overlook with me and I, I suggested you might want to stick around because those clouds are probably going to light up after the sun sets. And they said, no, nah, now nah, we're going to go eat supper. So they went to eat supper. I stuck around and sure enough, after sunset, then those light, those clouds started to light up with a lot of different colors. And we got more of a postcard image, something that uh, might be memorable to more people that uh, the scene now has more interesting light on it. But then well after sunset, I got what I thought was the most interesting photo. And this really moves beyond a picture of that particular river to something that's more about graphic shapes and colors and less about this particular river. So I would put this in the fine art category because it's not so much about the memory, but more just about the image. And sometimes it, this can all change very rapidly. Here's some photos that I took at uh, Donner Lake, uh, which is at Donner Pass in California. And you may be familiar with Donner Pass. It's uh, famous for pioneer cuisine. But this photo was taken at about 5.12 p.m. And late in the afternoon, sun was still shining bright. We had very harsh shadows, um, but we decided to stick around and just eat our dinner along the shore. And from 5.12 to 6.40, so about an hour and a half, now we're getting close to sunset. And you can see the light is getting more warm. Uh, the shadows are getting longer. It gets a little bit more color contrast between the trees and the blue sky. So a little bit more interesting photo. That was at 6.40. At 6.43, the light changed to this. So just three minutes difference, but the foreground fell into shadow. So rather than having the, the rather harsh shadows, now we had very soft light in the foreground. Uh, the light became more orange on the trees in the background. So it created even more color contrast with the sky. And also it got a little bit darker. So I had a longer shutter speed and that kind of smoothed out the, the ripples and waves on the water. So waves on the water, so it moved effect. effect. So in just that so three minutes, that three going, minutes from here, going from here to here, here, made a big difference, a big in, difference the in the final image. Craig, so, Craig yeah. we're, yeah. Getting we're getting an echo of you. Yeah, and all of a sudden, yeah, my, of a sudden my, my speaker, my speaker turned on. Turned on. Okay. Okay. Let me see if I Let can. Let me see if I can. If I turn, I'm afraid. If I turn, if I turn, it, I'm it, afraid it, down, I may not get it back. May not get it back. Is this better? Is this better? No. 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 Getting a small icon, a small icon, 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 icon with, a phone, with a phone number, with a picture of a telephone. Of a telephone. That seems to have replaced Craig. Craig. I'm wondering if that's a duplication. I'm about the duplication. Well, we do see Craig well, we do twice. See Craig twice. Let, me Let me try this. Try this. Is that better? Is that better? Oh. Oh. No. 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 
Okay. Is that okay. better? Is that better? No. No. Is that? Is that? It could be somebody could else be has somebody their else microphone. Has their yeah, it microphone. must be coming yeah, from somebody coming else. From somebody else. I guess ask again for everybody to mute themselves. Mute themselves. I don't know if on your screen you saw this, but uh, with the reference to Bob, reference it said Bob, trying to connect to audio. To connect to audio. And that's when it started that's happening. When it started I noticed happening. that. I noticed that. But it's it's gone from but my it's screen. It's gone now. from my screen now. Okay, I'm okay. going to mute everybody, everybody and then unmute and Craig. Then unmute Craig. Not sure which Craig. Not but sure I'm... which Craig, but I'm. Okay, I think you unmuted me. Can you hear me? Okay. So let me get back to where we were. So we were looking at uh, Donner Lake. So Shirley, I guess I'll look for you to give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down, good. Um, so these were taken right around sunset and sunrise and sunset are probably the most common time for dramatic landscapes. Uh, we look at some examples. This is at Bryce Canyon. This was during the middle of the day, uh, very kind of flat light coming over my left shoulder. So even though there's a lot of texture in the hoodoos, it's not near what it could have been. Later in the day at, I believe this is at sunset, uh, you get a lot more interesting light raking across the, uh, the hoodoos. And looking at this, this may have been later after sunrise. Um, but certainly more texture than what you get in the middle of the day. Uh, Bryce Canyon is one of those locations that's really kind of a sunrise location just because of the orientation of the escarpment. Um, if you look at it at sunset, you can get some really nice color in the sky, but the foreground will drop into shadow before the sky really gets the most interesting effects. So, you know, it's one of those locations because of its orientation north-south in the escarpment facing east, it's really more of a sunrise location because at sunrise is when you'll get some of the most interesting light shining on the hoodoos and lighting up the canyon. Now, in this case, it's a 360 degree or 180 degree panorama. So the light on the right hand side is what's illuminating the canyon wall on the left hand side. Photo of the uh, Tetons mid afternoon, uh, and it was a bit of a hazy afternoon because of fires along the uh, border with Yellowstone. But this was a scouting photo in the middle of the afternoon. But by the next morning, it was a much different scene. This is, uh, I believe it's Seven Mile Bridge uh, going out to Key West. Again, middle of the afternoon, but I liked the, the shape of the bridges and the kind of the graphic element of, the, uh, of those two shapes. But at sunset, you get a much more interesting image. Mesa Arch in the middle of the afternoon and at sunrise, again, a much different view. And this is very much a sunrise location because it's facing east. This is at uh, the Quail Creek, Creek Reservoir uh, looking east. This was in the late afternoon, early evening, kind of very flat light. Uh, but once we get into the blue hour with the moon rising, you can get a much more interesting image. Lastly, one uh, kind of a scouting photo in the middle of the afternoon or late afternoon. Um, but at sunset, the colors and the shapes and everything become much more interesting. So one thing I wanna point out is when you're looking at sunrise and sunset as being ideal times, avoid taking pictures of just a sunset because a sunset without a subject uh, tends to be fairly boring and not very interesting. And even if it's 
a fairly mundane foreground object, it can make a big difference between having just a snapshot of the sky versus something that's a little bit more interesting. So let's talk about the different kinds of light. Uh, I kind of alluded earlier that flat light with the sun coming from behind you or any kind of light coming from behind you tends to be the worst light. It doesn't show texture. Um, there's a saying that light illuminates, but shadows define. And without shadows, you don't get that definition of the shape of things and the texture of things. So photos tend to be pretty flat looking, where when you have light coming from the side, that creates shadows and you can see a lot more texture in the texture, for instance, of the, the rocks and the, the rubble here. This is at uh, uh, Great Basin up at the, uh, uh, the Twisted Forest area. Uh, you get a lot more texture in the rock. Here's a coffee farm. Again, light coming from the side really brings out the texture in the bushes. Here you can see the texture in the cactus uh, created by having the light coming from the side. When you have fall colors, uh, side light can really light up those colors during the day. Uh, likewise, any kind of texture or shape in rocks uh, is really brought out by side light. Sand dunes with ripples take on a lot of nice texture when you have side light, whether it's uh, early morning or late evening. It's during the day, it's hard to get good side light. One exception to that, though, is if you're walking in a canyon or along a, a hillside, if you look at that hillside, uh, and this is the, um, I think it's the Hellhole Trail uh, by the Sullivan Park. It, here we have fairly steep hills on both sides of the trail. On the left side, though, the sun is kind of raking down the trail and creating a lot of shadows. On the right side, it's shining directly on it. So if you look on the left side of the trail, if you're looking at details, you're actually getting side light and you know, even a little bit of backlight on that left side of the trail just because of the way the sun is shining down the hillside. Where on the right side, you have more front light. Uh, it's much flatter looking and much less interesting. Backlight is probably the most dramatic, also can be the most difficult to manage, uh, but for subjects like Choya and fall colors, it can really create an interesting glow. Uh, even during the day, a lot of subjects, again, like Choya, can show a lot of texture from backlight, especially when you have a dark background behind it. Of course, at uh, sunrise and sunset, you can get some interesting effects from the uh, backlight. And as I mentioned earlier, when you have fall colors, backlight can really cause those colors to pop out and create a lot of color contrast between the, uh, the bright yellow leaves and the blue sky. It's also a time when silhouettes become fairly easy to do uh, just by exposing for the sky and letting foreground subjects go dark. And again, during the, the day, if you look at hillsides, you can find backlight that will create a lot of texture uh, on hillsides and rock formations. Kind of a special topic that we have around here is the kind of light that we find in slot canyons. Um, slot canyons can have a lot of reflected light where the light comes in through the top and starts bouncing around and it can create a real interesting glow because the light will pick up the color of the rock and then intensify that color as it shines on other subjects. In fact, in this photo, we have kind of three different kinds of light. The yellow in the background is kind of semi-direct light shining on the canyon wall. Uh, the formation in the middle is getting illuminated by reflected light. So we have the orange light being reflected off the orange walls and then lighting up the orange rock. So it takes on more of a glow and more of an intense color. In the foreground, we have just very deep shade and the only light coming in there is the light from the blue sky. So we really have blue light illuminating red rock and it takes on that purplish color. So you can get real interesting color effects just by the different kinds of light that you find in a slot canyon. 
And reflected light will show up in places other than slot canyons. Uh, this is reflected light in the narrows where the light is shining on one, one hillside, reflecting off that, reflecting off the other, and then lighting up those trees. And this gives you a little bit better idea. Those trees are actually in the shade from the, the hillside on the right and the light's shining off of the hill on the left and then bouncing back and forth to eventually light up those trees. Another scene of reflected light in a canyon. Again, you get nice soft light, but it intensifies the colors. And this is a cathedral gorge, again, light uh, bouncing around and reflecting inside the gorge. Light and weather obviously can make a huge difference and a scene can take on a very different look just by a different time of day and different weather conditions and you'll have completely different images. So this is the, the iconic tunnel view at Yosemite um, in different light. It takes on a different look. When you have different light and different weather, it can again take on different looks. Uh, at sunrise, it's backlit. So if you don't have clouds, it can be interesting, but if you have high clouds at sunrise, it can become even more dramatic. Uh, my favorite is when you get clouds and weather and unique lighting situations. In this case, we were I was under the clouds, but a break in the clouds had the sun shining over the tops of the clouds and illuminating half dome in the distance. Another example, a little closer to home from the, uh, the mundane to maybe a little bit more interesting with some side light, uh, a little bit of snow in the air, snow and sunset creating some, some lighting. And even at night, it takes on a different look. So the same location under different lighting conditions and different weather conditions can be very different. So I'm never afraid to go back to the same location again, just like I wouldn't be afraid to go fishing again at the same lake or play golf again at the same golf course. Fog is a real plus when you find it in the right place. Uh, here we have the mist hanging over a lake at sunrise, uh, fog at a uh, the small boat harbor at sunset, and even mid-morning, if you have enough fog, it can create real dreamy conditions. Shadows are another real, real bonus when you can find them. Here, uh, the triangle that you see in the background is actually the shadow of the mountain I'm standing on at sunset. So I'm looking away from sunset and the, the mountain I'm standing on, and all mountains will project a triangular shadow. And if you get the right conditions, you can photograph that shadow uh, just before sunset. Again, using the, the shadow at sunset to just let the top of the butte be illuminated. This is Zabriskie Point at sunrise. And before sunrise, the light is very flat. Uh, it's kind of nice that the moon was coming up, but the, the light itself wasn't that interesting. Uh, Shortly after that, as the sun came up, it becomes much more colorful and you get a lot more texture. Reflections around water can really add to an image, whether it's at sunrise or sunset, and especially when you get uh, a lot of light in the sky. And sometimes it takes on just a completely abstract look. So as we looked at those different examples, the light is really, I think, what made a difference in the image. And we're talking about the quality of light, the direction of light, and the color of the light. And when we talk about the quality of the light, what we're really talking about is the quality of, or nature of the shadows. Um, hard light or soft light really refers to the type of shadows that the light creates. Hard light will create very hard edged shadows uh, whereas soft light, like a cloudy day, will create real soft shadows. Uh, midday sun tends to create very harsh shadows with hard edges, where an overcast creates soft or even no shadows. And one of the nice parts about sunrise and sunset times is you tend to have softer shadows. 
uh, and of course reflected light can be very soft, colorful, and yet still uh, directional. Direction of light is a big factor. Uh, side light will bring out the most texture and shape. Uh, front light tends to be flat because of no shadows. Uh, backlight, as we looked at, can be very dramatic, uh, but can be hard to control because of the contrast. Color of light uh, is a big variable. That sunrise and sunset provide very colorful light. Uh, the blue hour before sunrise and after sunset uh, has a lot of rich blues. The sky becomes very blue. Uh, you hear people talk about the golden hour uh, after, you know, around sunrise or actually after sunrise and before sunset. And again, reflected light also picks up and enhances the color. So dramatic landscape lighting is really about the quality, direction, and color of the light. And as I mentioned earlier, sunrise and sunset are ideal times to find that beautiful light, uh, the blue hour and the golden hour, when the light is soft, directional, and colorful. And in fact, those times are so meaningful for landscape photography and other things um, that they have defined different types of or different times of twilight, kind of the magic time of day for a landscape photographer. And it starts with solar twilight, which is really the golden hour, uh, when the sun is six degrees or less above the horizon. Sunset or sunrise is just the opposite, is when the sun disappears below the horizon. And then we have civil twilight, which is frequently called the blue hour, which is when the brightest stars and planets begin to be visible. That then gives way to nautical twilight. More stars are visible. And at the end of nautical twilight, the horizon is still just barely visible. Um, after that is astronomical twilight, which is when the sun is between 12 and 18 degrees below the horizon. And at the end of astronomical twilight, that's when the sky is fully dark. And after astronomical twilight, it's just dark. So, at the start of solar twilight, again, this is the golden hour. The light starts to become yellowish, orange, red, depending on the clouds and if there's any smoke in the, in the air. Uh, but that golden sunlight shining on fall colors can really light those up and intensify them. When you have haze in the air looking towards the sun, uh, it'll spread out and the whole sky will take on kind of an orangish, yellowish color. And don't forget to look the other direction too, especially when we have the uh, sunlight at sunset lighting up the, the red and orange buttes. Uh, they can start to really glow and take on a, a great color contrast against the blue sky. Details in the foreground can look interesting because you do still have some directional light and there still is quite a bit of color in the light, even for, uh, for things that are up close, whether you're looking towards the sunset or away from the sunset. But eventually you get to just before sunset. And if we're lucky, there will be some clouds that the sun will drop down below. So the sun starts to illuminate the underside of the clouds. And at sunset, the sun finally drops below the horizon. And we start to, start to get into sunset and then into my favorite, which is the blue hour or civil twilight. And civil twilight's usually about the first half hour or 40 minutes after sunset. And that's when the sky can really take on some of the most dramatic colors. And you get a lot of color contrast between the blue foreground and the sky in the background. But the best skies usually happen during civil twilight. I love that color contrast between foreground and background. And again, uh, you can get directional light and interesting color effects in the, uh, when you're looking both towards the sun and away from the sun or with side light. As we start to ease into nautical twilight, more of the uh, stars start to come out. Uh, the moon becomes very clearly defined. More stars are popping out. It's also a good time to experiment with light painting because you still have some color in the sky, so you don't have just a black sky, but you have the, the moon and the stars. So you can get some of everything during the blue hour and nautical twilight. 
It's also a good time if you want to photograph a building. It's a good time to balance the, the lights coming through windows with the sky to, to get that kind of a beauty shot of a building. Then we move into astronomical twilight. Uh, when it's really starting to get dark, the stars are really starting to pop. Uh, this picture is also showing what's called zodiacal light. That's that, uh, that kind of a glow, vertical glow that you see in the center of the image. That's a dust cloud around the sun that is only visible certain times of the year. Uh, but it's that dust around the sun being illuminated by the sun, uh, but glowing in the, in the dusk uh, astronomical twilight. The Milky Way starts to be visible during astronomical twilight. And eventually at the end of astronomical twilight, it's just dark. Uh, it's as dark as it's going to get until you reach astronomical dawn and we start the process in reverse. Again, it's a good time for light painting uh, and experimenting with that. But also you can frequently find light from uh, light pollution or even from the moon. So. Armed with all of this knowledge, I decided to get up early and go photograph sunrise on the beach. So I walked out on the beach and I knew I was facing east, so the sun was going to come up. But as I was wandering around, waiting and wondering, well, exactly when and exactly where is the sun going to come up so I can be ready? And then it dawned on me, I could use an ephemeris to find the exact time and direction of sunrise and sunset. Now, a basic ephemeris tells you the specific location, latitude and longitude, so it's where you're at. It tells you the sunrise and sunset times and directions. It will give you the twilight phases as far as the start and end times of the various phases of twilight. It'll give you the moonrise and set time and directions. And it may also include other astronomical bodies such as the, the galactic center of the Milky Way, planets and constellations. So if we look at an ephemeris for today, for here in St. George, uh, we would see that solar twilight begins at 6.06. The sun is six degrees above the horizon. At 6.42, so about now, is sunset, when the sun is going to disappear below the horizon. 7.09 is when civil twilight begin, ends. So civil twilight is from sunset to 7.09. Nautical twilight will end at 7.40. And by 8.10, we'll be at the end of astronomical twilight, and the sky will be fully and completely as dark as it's going to get. Now, generally speaking, sunrise and sunset times are real easy to find. If you just Google, for instance, St. George sunset time, you'll find out what time sunset is. And this was actually a few days ago. You can get more information by going to a website like photoephemeris.com and I have found that they now require that you sign up for a free subscription, so they have your email address. But you can go to photoephemeris.com, and that middle option in the bottom is to use TPE, which is the photo ephemeris, uh, on the web, which is a free version. And that will bring up this screen, or a screen like this, where you can put in your location, in this case, St. George, and it lists not only the specific sunrise, sunset times, but also all of the, uh, the start and end of the astronomical, nautical, civil twilight, sunrise, uh, moonrise, moonset, and also the directions of moonrise and moonset, sunrise and sunset. So if you're into planning, if you're out scouting, and now that you know sunset and sunrise time and the direction, you can go out with something as simple as a basic compass and you can look at the location. You can say, okay, I know the sun is going to set in that direction. And then when you go back at sunset, you're well prepared because you know where the sunset's going to be or where the sunrise is going to be. The real power, though, comes with the phone apps for either the photographer's ephemeris or photo pills. And these are the two I'm going to talk about the most. Um, they're both real popular. They have a lot of similar functionality. Uh, you can get both because they do some things different, uh, or you might opt for just one or the other, depending on what you feel like you need the most. They have a lot of extended functionality. Uh, 
not only the sunrise sunset times and directions, moonrise, galactic core, but also map visualization. So you can visualize what directions those are on the map. Uh, they have augmented reality where, you, where it uses your camera, the camera on your phone and overlays that with information so you can really visualize exactly what it's gonna look like on the scene. You can do future planning. If you know you're going on a trip in three months to some location far away, you can look at the lighting, sunrise, sunset, night sky for those locations. Uh, the Photographer's Ephemeris even includes a light pollution map so you can judge where do I need to go in order to find a dark sky at night. And they're pretty reasonable. Last time I checked, they were about $10 each. So uh, not horribly expensive. So you can plan in advance. You can uh, plan to capture the moon at a particular spot. Uh, if you want to visualize, you know, to line up the moon over some particular landmark, for instance, uh, plan a night sky shoot to judge when and where the galactic core is going to be visible and also when the moon is going to not be visible, which is usually something important for a night photo shoot. PhotoPills also has a number of additional tools where it will calculate depth of field for you. It'll do angle of view of different lenses. Uh, you can calculate uh, exposure offsets for neutral density filters if you want to do long exposures. If you're doing uh, night photography, it can tell you the exposure limit for getting sharp stars, depending on what direction you're looking and what lens you're using. And it can also do star trail angles of rotation, uh, again, for night photography. So if we go back to that, uh, that sunrise photo I showed earlier, I could use augmented reality in photo pills and it would present a view like this, looking through the, the camera on the phone so it would show me the scene in the background and overlaid on that is that diagonal line showing where the sun is going to come up. And then sure enough, that's where we see the sun when it comes up at that location. And that's really handy even in the middle of the day, you can be out planning and scouting and just look with your phone. And it's a little hard to see on the, the screen of the phone there in the image, but you can see a little bit of a red line going up above the horizon through the clouds. That's where the sun is going to rise in the morning. So I can go back in the next morning and I've already pre-scouted the location. So I know how to plan for sunrise to know where the sun's gonna come up. It's also real useful for nighttime planning. Uh, this particular plan was in Capitol Reef and it showed me a couple things of interest. It shows me the astronomical twilight ends at 1023. So it's middle of summer, pretty late in the day, but that's when it's gonna be dark. But I can also see the moon is gonna set at 1205. So I know I've got about an hour and a half of moonlight before it's completely dark. The galactic center though will be up until three o'clock in that, that row of dots that you see making an arch, that's illustrating the the Milky Way and the bigger dots are the galactic center. So I can see the galactic center is going to be to the south. And I know I have about an hour, hour and a half of moonlight before it's completely dark. And what I did then was use the, uh, the augmented reality, visualize where the Milky Way is going to be. And you can see it there on the right hand side. And you can also see where that was lined up with the clouds that were in the sky at the time. So what I actually did then was drive around, actually I had my wife drive and I watched the clouds and I could judge, well, when was there an interesting foreground with the clouds that were in the same place the Milky Way is going to be. So I used the clouds as a, a rough planning tool. And then when I found this hillside, we jumped out and I found a, a good location and confirmed with the augmented reality that the Milky Way was going to be to the right of that hillside uh, that should be interesting in the dark. And then I was able to go back at night. And sure enough, there was the Milky Way lined up behind that hillside. And in fact, knowing that I was going to have moonlight, I was able to do the photo in two pieces. So I was able to photograph the hillside by moonlight at around 10 30, 11 o'clock, something like that. And you can see that it was a long exposure and how 
bright and blurred the sky was. And then once the moon set, I was able to photograph the sky. Uh, but in that case, photographing the sky, the foreground was completely dark. But then by combining the two in Photoshop, I could get the best of both. When you first open the Photographer's Ephemeris, you get a screen that looks like this. So it kind of, when you open it up, it's ready to use. It will tend to use your time, current time, current location, and show you where you are uh, without a whole lot of fuss. So it's a little bit more user-friendly right out of the gate. When you first open the photo pills application, you get a menu of different options. And generally what you want is the planner, the one at the top left, uh, but it has a lot of these other functions. So when you first open the application, you have to make a choice of which option do I really want to use. They have a lot in common. They both have a basic screen. You set the location, you can set the date for a date other than today. Uh, you can set the time, you can use augmented reality, and actually they both have a form of augmented reality. Um, PhotoPills has more of the other tools like angle of view, depth of field, things like that. Uh, the Photographer's Ephemeris also has a day-night mode, uh, but it also includes, for an additional fee, uh, a tool called Skyfire, where it attempts to forecast for today and tomorrow how good sunset colors are going to be. So if you're, if you're really looking for a brilliant sunset, uh, it tries to look at the forecast and the clouds and give you a map of where the best sunset colors are going to be. And it does that for, I say, today and tomorrow. At one time I, I tried the, the free uh, subscription to that, but I did not, it's, it's a paid subscription and I never did pay for it. So what I'm going to try to do now is switch from my computer to the iPad and I'll have to log back in because I, when we were having that echo, I, I logged out of the, the, the session. So I'm going to try to get back into the session on the iPad and see if I can share my screen there and move over to that instead of the computer here. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. We're all still here. Okay, can you hear me on the iPad? Yes. And I need to mute the computer. Okay, can you hear me without an echo? Yes. Okay. So. Okay, can you see and hear me? Yes, and cool. yes. Okay, and it should be broadcasting the screen now. Mm -hmm. It's a screen so, broadcast. Yep, you are sharing a screen. Okay, so I'm going to switch to photo ephemeris. Should be able to see that now. Yes. And can you hear me okay? Let's see, I'm not hearing any feedback, so I'm not sure if you're hearing me or not. We are hearing you. Okay. Okay, so when you first open the photo of ephemeris, as I said, this is the screen that it comes up. Um, along the bottom, we have the moon set, astronomical start, nautical start, and so forth. So the different, different times of sunrise, sunset, uh, moonrise, moonset, the lines show the direction of sunrise and sunset. And then at the bottom, there's a graph that shows the sun and the moon kind of going up and down. And if I drag left and right on that, you'll see that the chart is moving. 
and the time is changing. So there's, there's around 655, 659. Uh, you can see the direction of the sun and the moon and where sunset and sunrise are going to take place. If I want to go to the location where I'm at, if I look over on the right hand side, you'll see a series of icons. The one that looks like a kind of a triangular arrow pointing up and to the right. Uh, the one at the very top is a share. So that would let me if I wanted to capture an image or send a message to somebody, I could do that. The next one down sets my location. So it just uses the, the location in the device and chooses that as the location. If I want to use a different location, as I start to zoom and pan around, you'll see there's a crosshair. So if I want to go to a different location, I can just locate that crosshair where I want to go and then tap the red pin and that will put the location there. So that doesn't have to be nearby. It can be here, it could be a long ways away. So that's how you would choose a location other than where you're at. At the top, you see the current the date, it says Monday the 26th. And then the left and right arrows, let me move forward or backward a day at a time, or is that moving a week at a time, I think. So if I move back to today, or if I just tap that date, I get the usual kind of drop down where I can choose a date. It gives me some of the events such as the uh, uh, full moon, new moon, uh, meteor shower, things like that. Some of the uh, astronomical events of interest. This is also, if you recall, I tapped the date at the top to bring up this menu. This is where I would choose between day mode where it currently is and that's a sun or night mode, which is the moon and stars. And in night mode, it does a couple things different. It has less details about twilights and sunrise and sunset, but it has the galactic center. So it tells us the GC or galactic center is gonna set at 9.22 PM, which is, you know, we're starting to get out of the, uh, out of the Milky Way season now. And it also it has more focus on astronomical twilights. As I scroll back and forth, you can see the, the arc of the Milky Way moving from, from right to left. And you can see that the screen gets dark when we move into twilight. So there's astronomical twilight and there's really not much time between astronomical twilight, which ends at 810 and the galactic center sets at 822. So I can go back to daylight, daytime mode just by going back to the date and then choosing day mode. There's a number of different map overlays that you can turn on that for instance, I can turn on the the one that looks like a cloud will turn on a cloud forecast, which again is a subscription. The one that looks like a street light turns on the light pollution mode. And that only shows when it's dark. So based on moving the time left and right, if I'm at a daytime setting, it doesn't show light pollution. When I move after sunset, then it shows the light pollution. And there's also a star mode that you can turn on and off that I find pretty worthless. Uh, you have different types of maps. This is the street map. This is a satellite view or a contour map just by tapping the different map types. This is a different street map. And then this is the, uh, the open uh, street and topo map. And I think that shows, says it's a cycle map. So I normally just have either the street or sometimes the, the topo map. 
but that's kind of um, the photographer's ephemeris in a nutshell. Uh, it's easy to use because you just you open it and you're there. You don't have a lot of other choices that you have to make before you can start using it. Uh, the date function is real easy to use. Uh, it defaults to today's date. You can move ahead and back a day at a time real easily. Uh, you can move the time real easily just by sliding along the bottom. It has some other features like uh, looking across the bottom. It has augmented reality. Uh, different. You can save locations, you can do visual searches, look at the lengths of shadows and the horizon, and you can even look at elevation offsets. But those are some of the more advanced functions that I don't want to spend a lot of time going through right now. Uh, so if there's no questions on that, let's move to the, the photographer's ephemeris. So I'll close that. I'll tap photo ephemeris. This has more options. These are the, the different pills, I guess they call them. Uh, but to get to something useful, now you have to tap on planner. And that will bring up the map view, very similar to what we saw in the, uh, the photographer's ephemeris. And likewise, it has the graph at the bottom that shows the time and I can move back and forth so at this point, you know, very similar to what we saw in the photographer's ephemeris. The details are over on the right-hand side as far as the uh, sunrise, sunset, the uh, golden hour, blue hour, uh, galactic center visibility, and even the galactic center height. So different layout. If you're looking at it on a phone versus an iPad, horizontal versus vertical, you'll have a different view. But the basic functionality is really the same. I find it a little more cumbersome to change dates and times. Uh, the time is easy to adjust, but for date, you have to actually click on the time here. And this brings up the date and time picker, and then you can pull up a calendar and move to a different day or a different time. But it's, it doesn't have that real easy, just go forward and backward a day like I like in uh, the photographer's ephemeris. So certainly still works, uh, just a few more clicks on the screen in order to move forward and backward. The things that really set the photographer or set photo pills apart is not so much this view, but some of the other functions, uh, some of the other pills as they call them. And it's augmented reality is a little nicer. If I click the AR button over here, and I'm scrolling left and right to, to change the time, and you can see the moon moving around. If I move the, the iPad around, you'll see that as I move, it's showing the sun and the moon Sorry, if that's making you seasick. Um, if we get it at the right time, we'll be able to see the, uh, the galactic center. So you can kind of get the idea of how it's putting the overlay using the the camera on the, in this case, on the iPad. I'll just click down on the top right to get out of augmented reality and back to the main screen. If I click back at the top left, that'll take me back to this main menu where I can choose um, some of the other options. So for instance, um, depth of field lets you put in a camera and it has a a big list of cameras, the specific lens, the aperture, subject distance, and then it will show you both numerically and graphically what the depth of field is going to look like. So you can do some more precise calculations of depth of field. Uh, you could even create a depth of field table if you want to quickly scan different options. Uh, it has a nice field of view if you use your phone for uh, scouting and framing, for instance. You can put in, again, a camera and a lens. 
and the subject distance, and it will show you numerically what the uh, angle of view would be, horizontal, vertical, diagonal. You can also go to a augmented reality, and this is at the bottom second icon from the left where it says AR. If I tap that, again, it uses the lens on the, the camera on the device, but you can see the orange, orange triangle showing what the field of view will be. Even if that field of view is bigger than what you can fit on the screen, you can kind of pan around and see where the field of view would be. And it will center on wherever you tap. So if you want to look there, you just tap in the center and it will center the box around where you've tapped. So that can be a useful feature if you're trying to compose and you don't have your camera with you and you want to visualize what different fields of view will look like. So, night AR, we kind of looked at. Night AR is just AR when it's a nighttime. It has meteor showers, star trails, and so forth. Um, most of those are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, if you need a timer, you can set a timer. So that's kind of the, uh, the photo pills in a nutshell. Uh, it lets you uh, save locations. Well, I guess both of them let you save locations. Uh, but the basic functionality of an ephemeris for either where you are or some other location at some other date it is probably the most useful feature of both the photographer's ephemeris and uh, photo pills. And if the features in photo pills, like the angle of view and depth of field and so forth, if those features sound meaningful to you and you're only going to get one, then I would suggest getting photo pills. If you're really just looking for a basic ephemeris for daytime and nighttime, um, and you want a little bit easier to use than I would, and you're just going to get one, then I would say the, the photographer's ephemeris is probably the, the easier and the less intimidating to use. Uh, if you're a big spender and you want to go all in, then explore both. So, covered a lot of ground. Uh, are there any questions? The only question that I have in chat is actually from me. Okay. When, when you're shooting in the slot canyons back in the beginning, where are you metering your light source? Where are you metering on? Generally, I'm shooting on aperture priority and just letting the camera do the work. I Most of the time when I'm out and about like that, uh, the most important thing to me, if I'm doing serious work, the most important thing to me is the aperture. Okay. So I will set the ISO at my lowest ISO. I'll set the aperture around F8 or F11, depending on whether I feel like I need more depth of field. Mm -hmm. um, generally, five around F5, 6 or F8 is going to be the sharpest. And as I start sharp stopping down more than that, you're going to start losing some sharpness to diffraction. Uh, uh, with the camera on a tripod, I don't really care what the shutter speed is. It could be a 30th of a second. It could be five seconds. Um, so I will let the meter and the camera take care of calculating an exposure and just monitor the histogram to see if I need to dial in some positive or negative exposure compensation. Okay. Okay. But do you use spot, matrix, or... Uh, it's it's usually kind of a center weighted I think is how center I have it. yeah that's the term I wanted yeah okay um, but I'm really watching the histogram and using exposure compensation if I need to so the whether it's spot would probably be the the most erratic to try to use so an averaging or center weight it's probably going to give you the most consistent results okay so that's the only one on chat but we can open up everybody's microphones if they if anybody has a question they can unmute themselves and ask the question this is not really a question it's more of a commentary about your comment about the blue hour uh 
just a bit of a historical narrative. A couple of years, a few years back, I was up at the uh, Cannon Beach in Oregon. Uh, and as it got close to sunset, there must have been 200 photographers out on the beach at low tide looking for the perfect shot. And as soon as the sun went down, like 90% of them left. And that's when the fun started. That's when the, yeah. you know, it, 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 I, was, I was absolutely amazed. Uh, because that those were, by, by a country mile, were the best shots of the whole day. Yeah, I have seen that over and over again, where everybody leaves as soon as the sun hits, <laughs> drops below the horizon, and they oh. need to stick around another 45 minutes. Oh. Because that's and really when the best light happens. Yeah, oh. and even if you tell them, stick around, the show's just beginning, people look at you like you're nuts. Yeah. Yeah, okay, sure. We need to get down before it gets dark, okay. <laughs> This was very good, Craig. I really uh, learned a lot. Um, I like the going through the two different um, tools, I guess you can call them. They do yep. look a little different on my phone, though, <laughs> my Android <laughs> phone. <laughs> it does look different than what you had on your iPad, but I could follow along pretty good. Yeah, they, they work the same, but the orientation of the, the different menus and features will change. Yeah, yeah, but otherwise it looked pretty much the same. In fact, if I just rotate the the iPad, uh, it'll probably look more like that on your phone. Kind of does, yes. Any questions from anybody else? Okay, I think we're good. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming along tonight on the.